So hi everyone, it's Taviana speaking, uh, events manager at Tina. I see that it's uh, 3, 4 past uh, 3 p.m. So I think uh, we can officially start uh, this webinar on NG112 implementation steps. Um, so as I told you, I'm uh, Taviana and uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you on one of uh, the series of uh, the INA webinars. I will run and moderate uh, this webinar along with my colleague uh, Cristina Lumbreras, our technical director at INA. And uh, before uh, giving the floor uh, to uh, my colleague, uh, I will uh, provide you uh, a, um, a little information um, on uh, the running of, uh, of this webinar. Uh, so the webinar uh, will be recorded. Uh, and uh, you will receive um, an email tomorrow afternoon uh, telling you that uh, the recording and the presentations are available on the uh, webinar uh, webpage, uh, but also on our uh, INAS YouTube channel. Uh, also, um, you will be able uh, during the presentations uh, of today uh, to uh, submit uh, your questions. And uh, at the end of uh, the presentations, uh, we will uh, read them uh, along with my colleague uh, Christina uh, and uh, the speakers um, uh, will answer them. So at the end of the presentations, but feel free to, to submit uh, your, your questions um, during, during uh, their speech. Um, also, uh, that being said, uh, I think it's, uh, it's time for me to give the floor to my colleague uh, Christina. So our, uh, Technical Director Atina, uh, who will uh, introduce uh, our speakers of today uh, and also uh, the aim of uh, this webinar. Uh, Christina, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tavi. Thank you for the introduction and also uh, thank you to all of you for attending uh, this uh, webinar. So as uh, you know, we have been uh, working on Next Generation 112 for many years already mostly on the technical side. We have uh, performed the uh, tests, uh, we have uh, published the uh, standards, and uh, we think that now is uh, the, the big step uh, the uh, of uh, the implementation of uh, Next Generation 112 in Europe. So to make uh, this uh, implementation possible, of course, we will need uh, that uh, all stakeholders uh, take uh, some actions. So uh, it's a uh, a common effort and uh, well this is the main goal of uh, this webinar to explain how we see the involvement of different organizations uh, at the european and national and also at the regional level and uh, this way we think that we will uh, make uh, the implementation of uh, ng112 in europe a reality so we have today uh, three experts on NG112 with us. Uh, Luca Bergonzi, who is uh, the co-chair of uh, the INA Technical and Operations Committee. We have also Wolfgang Kampichla, uh, co-chair of the INA Technical and Operations Committee too. And uh, uh, we have also Michael Puesla, who is uh, the main author of uh, the document uh, we published uh, several uh, days ago uh, on uh, the NG112 implementation steps. And uh, I will not uh, enter more into the details of, uh, of this document as I wouldn't uh, like to spoil the, the presentations. I just uh, would like also to share with you what will be uh, the next uh, events uh, we are planning on NG112. Uh, first, we will have uh, end of February, so on the 22nd of February, we will uh, uh, the fourth edition of the NG112 plug test event will start. Uh, this is an event uh, INAC organized together with Etsy and uh, this year also with uh, Nina. And uh, I have also the pleasure to, uh, to announce that uh, in April, uh, well, the, the, the exact dates are still to be confirmed. Uh, we will, uh, INA will organize a virtual event uh, dedicated to Next Generation 112. Uh, in this event, uh, we will have more time, of course, to go uh, deeper in, uh, in this topic. 
and uh, focused on the European uh, situation of implementation and also we will look again on the specific uh, steps uh, to be taken. And we will uh, also share experiences with other organizations all over the world. So now I think it's time that I give the floor to the presenters. So uh, I think, Luca, you will uh, start. Yes, thank you, Christina. <clears throat> so let me um, share the screen. Screen, okay. Can you see my screen? Yes, Luca, and we can see you in the camera as well. Mm -hmm. Now? Yes, it's perfect. We can see you in the camera and your slide. Okay, perfect. So <clears throat> let's talk about a little bit of introduction for NG112. This is actually the fourth webinar I'm having about Next Generation 112. Three of them were taken by, by, by myself <clears throat> in the months of September and October. For those of you who participated, okay, fine, you know about them. <laughs> those who don't, who didn't, don't worry, they will be published uh, uh, soon on, um, uh, let's say, video format. Just follow my social media and you will know when they will be available to everybody else uh, who wasn't able to attend. Let's go straight into the topic. So <clears throat> today we will not just discuss uh, what is NG112 uh, because it's good to have a refreshment every now and then, but also why it's important to think about it right now and what's the situation in Europe currently. So <clears throat> first of all, let's start with the perception of NG, next generation. Uh, a lot of people normally <clears throat> uh, think about next generation as uh, adding new capabilities to what we have normally as emergency calls, transforming calls into communications. So uh, ways to access natively with video, text, voice, uh, geolocation, using IoT devices and so on to contact emergency services. As we all know, today the, the mainstream way for doing that is by a uh, phone call. Fixed, la fixed phone or mobile phone, the concept is the same. There are several cases uh, around Europe where we know uh, of, let's say, partial solutions, uh, proprietary solutions, workarounds, uh, which enable, for example, video or which enable text, SMS or others. Uh, what Next Generation 112 and the technology all around it <clears throat> want to achieve is to provide the capabilities to any type of device uh, because it's embedded inside these devices, the capability of making uh, multimedia communications, and uh, also to avoid the restrictions due to certain technology and so on. But there is another aspect that a lot of people sometimes uh, underestimate, and that's uh, the capability of intelligent routing for these new med media types and intelligent delivery to the proper destination. So let's see the two aspects, or in principle, let's be clear on the topic. Next Generation 112 as an idea is more a service enabler rather than introducing new things. Um, Next Generation 112 technology will allow, for example, video conferences between a citizen and a PISA natively. That's okay. But video conferences in general already exist. It is not through NG112 that we are creating a new type of media. We can see that today there are SIP calls, video calls, SIP chatting or messaging, native SIP. We see that there are over the top, these OTT over the top services like Skype and WhatsApp that can do the same. And we also know that there are legacy networks or legacy technologies that exist that will still continue to exist for some time, like uh, the traditional e call, pan European e call, or the traditional uh, landline phones. So, all of these can be <clears throat> um, diverted, can be moved into a next generation uh, 112 uh, network that will enable the PSAPs to get in touch with them. So, if you want, the endpoints have to be adapted while the core is what has to be changed. Let's concentrate now on how we 
um, move these contents, move these media, these communications from one point, the citizen, to the PSAP on the other side. Traditional networks, this is the way it's done today, no? Traditional networks usually include, like I mentioned before, landline phone calls and mobile phone calls. There are carriers who have their position. In some extent, they can locate these calls, either through subscription or cell-based triangulation. And then the network is the <clears throat> responsible for routing the call to the proper destination. This is how, in principle, this is how it goes today. Um, the next generation technologies move this um, a further level. So it introduces a new way of doing that, and it also modifies the concept behind. So if you want responsibility or flexibility. Tomorrow, citizens will be able to use all kinds of communications. Here I made some examples uh, that I used already before, uh, chatting, SIP calls, video, geolocation native from their own devices, this time not from the network anymore, e-calls, traditional call, RTT text. These are all forms of communications that today have some troubles in being um, carried over to the emergency services, but with next generation 112, there will be much more <clears throat> possibility for them. What's in the core of the next generation 112 architecture? We have a network called ESI Net, Emergency Service IP Network, which is composed mainly by three elements and all the surrounding gateways to get in and get out. No? Let's go step by step. If we talk about native SIP calls, such as the ones provided by today, the majority of uh, telecommunication companies can provide SIP trunking as the media uh, connection element, uh, they can be transported to uh, a SIP proxy, let's say without going too much in the detail, uh, which manages these calls. There is an embedded uh, location uh, information within the SIP calls with an update of the SIP protocol. And <clears throat> on the other side, we have other media, which are not natively SIP, that can be transported inside the ESINET through other gateways, appropriate gateways defined for that technology that can translate them into SIP. So in principle, potentially, these communications may not have embedded geolocation information. This location information can be provided to the ESINET through other means by the carrier or by other means. In principle, this will be stored in a location service also part of the assigned architecture, uh, with the scope of giving the information to the SIP proxy, because the scope of the SIP proxy is to, first of all, know the location of the source of the call, oh, sorry, of the communication, right? No matter what's the nature of this communication, the first thing is I have to have the source location. With this location in my hands, I can use a routing server to effectively define the destination of the call. So the idea is that what with the source and with the destination, I can route the calls to the, to the proper PSAPs. As you see in this picture, I also define two ways, two types of PSAPs. We can have the fully equipped SIP trunks, whatever next generation PSAPs, or we can have also legacy technology in a PSAP, which will not cut them out from the next generation architecture. It will simply need them to go and retrieve some data <clears throat> as they are doing today to finally define where's the source of the call. No? Like imagine AML. PSAPs go and retrieve this information from somewhere, like AML server or another sort of service. They will, the, the old legacy PSAPs will continue doing that even in the future, no? until they migrate to the next generation. So in principle, here you see that we are talking about call routing. Um, the routing server today is represented here as specifically geolocation-based routing, but this is not all. In fact, uh, the assignment is suited to manage other types of um, routing, which today are not possible. For example, skill-based routing, for example, policy-based routing. Let's see some examples now of 
real applications of NG112 and how every country can benefit from its uh, delivery and from its uh, <clears throat> deployment even now. So here we have a situation, some of you have recognized the picture, the, the, the map. We had a particular case, no? we had a situation here where a terrorist attack may happen and the possibility using next generation Ubuntu technology is that you may in pseudo real time define an area around this uh, terrorist attack or whatever. Today we have COVID so we can think about a COVID hotbed as well. So you may define an area saying that all the calls coming from inside this area should be routed in real time to another destination which is not the regular PSAP concerning the area outside the box. Um, today this would be a lot complicated because it means uh, you have to define an area which yesterday didn't exist and tomorrow hopefully will not exist anymore because of the emergency will be <clears throat> uh, over. But not only that, you cannot specify today such a shrinked level of, um, uh, let's say, definition, because here we're talking about native location from devices, not just a generic BTS location or whatever. By doing so, by creating uh, real-time uh, areas where you can route the call, you can, on the other side, define a group of PSAP operators dedicated to the scope, or you can even define a new a newly, you know, uh, set up piece up from scratch that you created one day before or the structure was there but it was simply empty, no operator was working there, a sort of civil defense kind of activity and route the call from this box straight into the new point, leaving the rest of the 112 calls coming from the surrounding to the proper piece up so that you may avoid situations like uh, a lot of people calling because of the terrorist attack and then somebody having a heart attack with no association whatsoever with a terrorist attack needing to wait in line because all the lines of 112 in that area are, are overloaded. This is a, an example. So um, modifying the, <clears throat> the traffic of course depending on the special emergency situation. We can think about uh, TPS, third-party service e-call providers, let's say private e-calls or other type of private agencies private agencies which have to do with their own customers, insurances and stuff, who at the same time need to be connected with public safety for managing particular cases. Today, for them, for these kind of subjects, the communication with public safety is very complicated because they have to go through a certain, let's say, procedure which is uh, somehow <clears throat> blocked by the technological limitations which may be overcome with next generation 112. Let's make an example of TPS e-call. So today, when a TPS e-call provider receives a call from a car, this is basically a point-to-point -point communication. Car communicates with their own service provider, premium uh, insurance company, whatever, right? So the car sends over data from, from its own vehicle and the location of the car. But when the call reaches the TPS call provider, then they cannot dial 112 to reach the proper piece. Imagine if that car was an, an Italian car in, 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 uh, in Spain with the TPS call provider in, in France. How would the French guy sitting at the desk get in touch with the proper piece up in Spain? It, it, they cannot simply dial 112. They have to go through a network discovery to understand where to send the call. Not only this, but the network would recognize not the location of the car, but the location of the TPS office, because that's where the call is coming out from. So it's very complicated today to get in touch with a single piece up in Europe by these kind of subjects, not to mention the data. Data is not even standardized, completely standardized. Yeah, there is a document, but it's hard to say how many TPS call providers are compliant and how many PSAPs are actually receiving data in that format. So today this situation is very much depending on the goodwill agreements, local agreements made by, <clears throat> by entities and so on. Let's see what could be with next generation 112. So we have still the same kind of transmission, car sending data and position, the TPS adding on top their own position, so the physical position, and this would be sent 
to the SIP network, to the ASINET with location inside, right? So location inside and data, why not? The SIP uh, protocol also has, let's say, space for extra <clears throat> metadata, which can be added on top. At this point, the SIP proxy may even decide uh, by policy-based routing to discard the information from the TPS call. It would recognize that they just received a TPS call, so a specific type of call. Discard the information of the PSAP, of sorry, the TPS uh, office, which is absolutely useless in this case. Instead, using the location of the car to determine the appropriate route for the appropriate PSAP, even in another country, and by the call, so over the call, the same call, forward the data for the PSAP to read at in one single step. This would solve a lot of current issues and it would increase the possibility for emergency operator to get a lot more of information by <clears throat> TPS agencies or insurances, if it's a matter, for example, of clinical records and stuff, uh, just by transmitting a simple call or even a video call and so on. Um, but there are more examples. We can also talk about um, policies. So you may actually route calls by using time of the day, daytime, nighttime, date of the year. You can define procedures that say that on the 25th of December, you don't want to use a particular piece, but all the calls should go to another place. And as simple as that, you don't need to go on networks, modify the configurations, and then go back on the 26th and modify them again to go back on the original case. You would simply add the policy that says, when this is the date, calls go there, and all the other dates, the calls go, to the proper place. You may define then on language uh, or phone number international prefix. You may define the, uh, okay, I also included weather conditions. I know it's a little bit crazy, but the idea is really that you may define policies based on your needs when using an NG112 type of network. And you may modify them even in real time. Like I mentioned before, if you need to switch daytime, nighttime, you can do that. If the next day you decide that this policy doesn't apply anymore for your infrastructure, for your emergency service, you simply take the rule away from the uh, NG112 network. <clears throat> Finally, another very important uh, example that today has been discussed a lot, indoor geolocation. There are already companies, private companies, who can provide uh, IP, voice over IP services to um, uh, buildings uh, to branches of other companies and so on, whoever has uh, the possibility of having a multi-floor, multi-leveled, multi-building uh, facility. No? Today, you may have one single exit point for this facility or even multiple facilities may have one single one. Imagine I can make a, the example of our company. No? So Beta 80 has an office in Milan and in Rome and other offices, but there is one single exit point. All the other, all my colleagues that are working from Rome, their, their soft phone in, on their PC is connected with our PRBX in Milan. So if they dial 112 from Rome, they will be routed to the 112 in Milan, wrongly. But this is how it goes, because our PRBX cannot say the office is in Rome, but some companies, can actually provide this kind of information. And with the proper NG112 network on the other side, you may take this information and saying, okay, this call is actually coming from a location in Milan, but look at inside at the destination, sorry, at the source location. This is located somewhere in Rome on the third floor of a building on desk number 5A. And this is the type of detail you may reach by joining technologies. One side, companies who provide enriched voice over IP services. On the other side, next generation 112 core network. I hope that these examples uh, were exhaustive. I think we may create uh, another hundred of examples which are um, as exhaustive as these, but they all should inspire the idea that introducing an NG112 network today will enrich and enlarge the capabilities of emergency services when combined with the existing or future technologies. So let's say because sooner or later 
network operators, MNOs, carriers, and so on, will anyway switch from the traditional 2G PSTN technology to a full um, IP, 5G, call it however you prefer, but they will switch sooner or later to these technologies that will support all the features that you have seen in these examples. My point is, let's go into this as soon as we can, avoiding to be unprepared, avoiding justification of saying, I cannot use metadata or enriched communications. Get, let's get prepared now before the, te the technology is there. Uh, one final thing on my side, and then I will leave the floor to <clears throat> uh, my colleagues. So what's the situation of today in Europe about NG112? Consider that in, in the US, they're also running uh, similar um, uh, projects, US and Canada, and they have their own uh, situation and their own uh, stories to tell. But the most important thing is that they're using the same technology. They're using the same standards to develop NG911. So the story of NG112 goes back in 2013 when INA publishes the long-term definition document based on NINA I3. So NINA, this is a, you know, a friendly name, NINA I3. Actually, there is a very a more detailed name, but if you search for it, you will find it. NINA already published before 2013 a document which described the, the concepts of the ESINET, NG112 network, and that was also taken from Luca, we don't hear you anymore. Yes, we can see you, but we lost. Can you hear me? No, now, yes, again. Okay, it's back. Okay, sorry. It's, no problem. Yeah, it's the the okay, the headphones. I, I was saying that Ina so took the information, <clears throat> um, working together with Ina, publishing an, a European version, let's say, of this architecture. They took in consideration our own European flavor on the on the technology. Uh, Sometime past 2016, INA and Etsy joined forces to organize the first European plug test event, which was used to show the interoperability between standardized elements with 15 industry participants and five observers. In other words, um, uh, it was the first chance of European technology providers to uh, meet face to face. Uh, interoperability and to, to run interoperability tests just to show that was written what was written in the long-term definition document in the NINA I3 was actually working. It was the first time for European actors doing so. So that's another very important milestone. Next year, as to show how the topic beca became more and more important, it's in INA returned for the second plug test. Another time, 15 industry participants and two observers. We went further, creating new scenarios, having new participants, and so on. In 2018, it was the first time that a European country published an RFP for the renovation of the National 112 platform, including requirements for an ESINET according to the INA long-term definition document. It's um, a very important milestone, again, because it means how um, countries started thinking about uh, the advantages brought by this technology and this kind of implementation. So uh, I would say, again, a very important moment in the history of European Next Generation 112. Then we had the third plug test. Again, this time 12 industry participants, final scopes for the um, implementation, new scenarios, new people at the table. We had a visit of several interested countries who are now thinking about uh, how to implement this kind of um, platforms. And then we also had in October 2019, the French Digital Agency publishing an RFI for a definition of a nationwide ACNET platform for the existing 112 service. Another very important step. This was not an RFP yet, but it's uh, anyway a, the goodwill of a country in looking into this technology and understanding how they could benefit 
from an existing uh, um, standard to be applied to their own national uh, needs for emergency services. December 2019, I put this date in red because among all, this is probably one of the most important, if not the most important uh, um, uh, milestone so far, because it's the publication of the standard, the European standard. So I've been talking to people saying, uh, you know, until before December 2019, saying, okay, yeah, but your ideas are all based on something coming from the US. And several European countries may be a little bit um, skeptical in adopting something which we did not certify or standardize our, ourselves. And okay, then INA actually have been working hard with, uh, with Etsy exactly to reach this point to say, look, there is now a document. This is a European document. It comes from standardization procedures, from the plug tests, and from all the activities done inside the committee to formalize what a next generation 112 or better, what an ASINET is made of and how to make it. So this is the referred document when we talk about uh, ASINET here in Europe. Uh, we have another final milestones, which is the INA uh, uh, pilots. So last year, before the, the, the shutdown, uh, unfortunately, to COVID, we were able to complete, um, to, to launch and complete three pilot projects involving a sign at deployment, um, including cross-border IP multimedia scenarios. So if you go on the INA website, you can see the reports of all three projects, but again, this is an important milestone. It was officially, if you want, the first uh, deployment of ASINETs across European countries with the same purpose, uh, showing how the routing can be done on native SIP media and also including other case scenarios, like uh, one of them is um, mentioning the cross-border IP scenario, no? where you cross a border and normally you are still connected with the previous country Next, uh, sorry, previous country PSAP, we, in, in this uh, scenario, it is shown how next generation also solves this kind of problem. And last but not least, uh, I would say it's not European Union, but still Republic of Northern Macedonia issues an RFP, not long ago, by the way, for the upgrade of the national 112 system, again, including requirement for the delivery of NG112 components. It's another important step. As we see, it's a second case when a country takes the advantage, takes the opportunity of refreshing a national 112 platform and in, in that refreshment, uh, being so much wise to say, okay, it's time we deploy something new completely, including also routing mechanisms and call delivery functionalities. This is where we are today, but I'm pretty sure that soon, other things will happen soon other countries will be getting interested in this uh, technology and how they should get in touch with the <clears throat> idea of the next generation of what that's exactly the rest of the webinar and what we are discussing today so taviana my part is over if you want to take back the presentation and leave the floor to my colleagues yes Thank thanks you. a lot luca for this uh, very informative uh, presentation and uh, really this um, refreshment about the functioning of NG112, it was really clear. Uh, so now uh, I will give the floor to the next uh, speaker who is uh, Michael, Michael Prostler. So Michael, the floor is yours. Perfect. I hope you can hear me all well. Yes, perfectly. Perfect. You can start. Okay. Um, yeah, hi, my name is Michael Pressler, and I also want to welcome you all today to this um, webinar. So I'm going to talk about um, the document which was published um, regarding NG112 entered implementation guidelines. So why did we write this document in the first place? When we consider NG112, we have three aspects. We have the why, the what, and the how. And the why was basically covered by Luca, so explaining why we need it, what are the possibilities, um, what are the innovations capable um, when we're doing NG112. The what, 
that is described in the technical specification 103479, which describes the technical components, the interfaces, and how those components interact with each other. So when we wrote this document, we were focusing on the how, mainly on non-technical guidelines, on which processes, which milestones you need, and of course also which stakeholders you need to have on board in order to achieve a NG112 NG deployment. We also followed an inside-out approach, so that means building the NG112 architecture from the core to allow um, to adapt early to this technology and also um, having the benefits of that deployment as early as possible. So in order to getting started, as basically for any project, any idea you have is you need to bring people together which are responsible for realizing that idea. And in terms of NG112, um, we have a lot of different stakeholders. So this is important to have um, representatives from each of those groups within your responsibility group. And that includes like members from the national authorities, emergency services, piece of operators, mobile operators, but also um, telecom um, regulators, for example. Thinking of budgeting the whole venture, basically, um, Keep in mind that you need to have a procurement of the infrastructure and the core services, as well as the operations. There might be fundings for PSAPs which need to upgrade their technology to be able to um, take part in an NG112 deployment, and of course, the overall um, project management. We split the document into seven different milestones, which I will explain in more detail. And the goal is to have at the end a European wide NG112 deployment. And even if it is European wide, it's still important that each country keeps its local autonomy. So that means that even if you, even to the public, that it seems like it is one um, system, in reality, it is multiple NG112 deployments, namely one per country, which are interoperable to each other and only act transparently to the public. So it's not a centralized system. Regarding the milestones, they act like guidelines for the deployments. But of course, since we have different situations in the countries, different organizations and responsibilities, um, this might need some adaption depending on your current situation. So starting off with the first milestone, as you begin, when you want to implement NG112, you should have, or at least as a first step, have a plan how you want to um, how you want to serve the public, which emergency services do you want to provide. And this also is heavily depending on your emergency service model. So for example, do you have filtering piece ups, staged piece ups, and so on. Another important aspect you should consider when um, developing this plan is um, which organizations, which piece ups are responsible to providing which service for a geographic jurisdiction, for example. In addition to that, also um, consider fallback and support scenarios. So are there PSAPs which take over um, for other PSAPs when they are, for example, under maintenance or under heavy load? Or even in, in, in exceptional cases, like Luca described before, do you have like um, ad hoc um, PSAPs for very special scenarios, for example? So once you have that plan, you can start with having the layer, the, the, the infrastructure for providing emergency services. So basically, we need an IP-based infrastructure for those services. And this is also known as the ESINet, so the Emergency Services IP Network. But regarding this milestone, it's not only, not only um, about hardware and the network itself, but also you need some processes on how to have, how to establish um, authorization and authentication. So you need that basically on a national level. So you need the national authentication and authorization mechanism, which provides the processes of how, how to get access, who gets access, and also what are the technical requirements to access in, um, an ESI net. Once you have the infrastructure, on the top of the infrastructure, you can put the next generation core services. 
So the core services actually provide the powerful routing capabilities of the NG112 architecture. And here we have the emergency service routing proxy, the SRP, the emergency call routing function, the CRF, the location information service. Um, this can be also combined, for example, with advanced mobile location. And there's a, um, this is also handled in a document. And for a security layer, a border control function. And when procuring or provisioning those services, what is really important is that you need to make sure that those components um, implement and follow the interfaces specified in the technical specification. So, because this allows you to add other applications, services, and components, which are also standard conform to the um, next generation core services and then enable um, better and um, better and additional services on the top of that. So in addition, this also allows you a kind of best of breed approach. So um, you can basically pick those components from any vendor which provides those components and you can pick the best components um, by your needs. And you're avoiding a vendor login with proprietary interfaces, but you can actually choose the best components, putting them together, and they are interoperable with each other through those standardized interfaces. So once we have the core services up and running, um, it is time to enable the PSAPs. When we're enabling the PSAPs, there are mainly two aspects. We have a technical and an operational one. So the technical requirements for PSAPs is that they need to be able to process IP-based emergency calls, voice over IP calls, and in addition, parse or handle the data coming with those calls. On an operational process, since we now have different types of emergency communications with chat and video, for example, you need to also think about the process and how you will manage those other media types, because the protocol of um, following a, a normal phone call might be different um, from processing an emergency communication via chat. So once the, the PSAP is enabled, you of course need to connect to the ESINet and configure the ESINet appropriately to route emergency communications towards the PSAP. So at this point, once you have PSAPs which follow the standard, which are capable of processing um, emergency communications in a standardized way, you already benefit from other standard conform services. So for example, you can put um, IoT providers, um, providing them access to the ESI net. You can add over the top applications. For example, there are standards for doing chat or real-time texting. And if over the top applications implement that standard for the PSAPs, it's completely transparent which application initiate the emergency call via chat. So this is already a big benefit um, for the PSAPs and um, what is enabled by the standardization and the ng 2 architecture. In addition, also as Lucas said, you can enable VoIP providers to connect to the um, ESI net in a standardized way. So you can have, for example, Skype or WhatsApp connecting um, to an ESI net and root calls or even trusted, um, um, trusted um, VoIP um, providers from, from private companies, for example. So when the PSAP is enabled and we have all the other services um, already being able of, of processing um, standardized emergency communications, when looking into pushing it more to the mobile phones area, so the first step of course is bringing mobile operators on board. So they need to connect to the ESINet and being able to forward calls um, via voice of IP to the ESINet. So at that point, we do not have um, like the, the mobile phone's GPS location. But what mobile operators can do that they can enrich um, the call when forwarding to the assigned with additional data. So they should provide, for example, the cell tower location or um, subscriber information. And of course, they need to prepare for voice over LT and video over LT calls. Once the mobile operators are prepared for handling those um, voice over IoT and video over IoT calls, it is important to bring in the mobile operating system. So here, 
they should perform in native voice of IoT, video IoT for emergency calling. And similar to what they do currently with AML, when the mobile operating detects, uh, when the mobile operating system detects that an emergency call is performed or initiated, it should automatically integrate the location um, in the call setup. Another important aspect um, of the mobile operating system is they should provide an API for emergency applications. So as you currently, for example, have, if you write an application for Android or iOS and you want to dial a number, any number out of this application, you have an API and the mobile operating system takes care of how the call is initiated. And this should be similar to emergency calls. So apps should be able to initiate emergency calls for a specific service, for example. Um, the operating system takes care of at least adding the location to that emergency call, but the apps should also be able to add their additional um, data as well. So that could be, for example, metadata data or any other sensor data, for example. So basically after that milestone six, you have a, a fully NG112 architecture deployed in, in your country. So in order to have a European interconnection, in order to have a European wide NG112 deployment, what we need is um, similar to your country's authorization authentication mechanism. We, we, we need um, a similar one based on an European level. This would then allow to um, forward calls to other emergency um, service networks. And for example, as with the um, third party e-call providers, that would solve also the, the issue here, that they can forward emergency calls to other um, ESI nets, including the data. And of course, again, every country keeps its local autonomy, so it's not a centralized system. And you do not need to wait until every country has a full NG112 deployment. You can, for example, also start with your neighboring countries. So to sum it all up, basically you can and should start with the NG112 implementation right now. Um, you can get already the benefits on the way and in my personal opinion, it's really the foundation for future innovation in emergency services. So if you want to know more, I encourage you to read the document. Some parts are definitely explained in more detail than I have talked about in the webinar here. And of course, you can always reach out if you have any questions. Um, so now I would like to give the floor to Wolfgang, who talks a little bit more about the projects and the upcoming events. Yeah, thanks, Michael. Uh, so let's have a look at a few examples uh, in which we have implemented the NG112. Uh, next slide, please. So this year, as already mentioned by Luca, we have successfully completed the INA NG112 project. And as you can see on the slide, the following three teams were involved in the project and we demonstrated individual scenarios. So. The first one listed here is CELEST, which stands for cross-border ESI net and lost emergency services testing. So basically uh, interconnected ESI net deployments in Austria, Italy, and Denmark. And the participants were Copenhagen Greater Fire Department, uh, Leitstelle Tirol or Emergency Services Tirol, uh, the Emergency Center Trento, 112 Bolzano, Beta Iti, the Austrian Ministry of Interior, frequent discrete gears and as observer we had also the Austrian regulator. Another project was submitted by a Croatian team, uh, so main areas in this project were emergency video, real-time text, voice calls utilizing the NG112 architecture and here the participants were the Croatian Civil Protection Directorate and King ICT. And finally a Turkish team uh, with the aim to demonstrate the call routing, emergency video call and real-time texting uh, participated in the project and uh, members of the team in Turkey were the Ambulance and Emergency Physicians Association, the Turkish Ministry of Health, Amacom Information Technologies, Havestlan and Turkcell. I'm not going 
into further details of these projects, and please note that all the project documents and recorded webinars can be found on the inner side. Next slide, please. So since uh, NG112 implementation is on the agenda, uh, let's take a closer look at the Celeste project uh, as an example for this international rollout for an international rollout. So remember, Celeste is the shortcut for cross-border ESINet and lost emergency services testing. So our uh, main focus was uh, to interconnect different ESINet deployments. So, so we had uh, three different uh, regional deployments. And in order to make up the complete architecture, we also included uh, an element uh, that is known as forest guide. So basically we have interconnected ESINets uh, that also, as mentioned by Luca, allow this kind of rooming uh, among different countries. So if you're in a, in a, in a border environment and perhaps connected uh, to a network of the other country, you may get a uh, route to a different visa, but with the technology or with the capabilities of the NG-112 architecture, we were successfully demonstrating how calls can be routed even in, in such situations. In addition, uh, we, we had uh, several different uh, applications uh, to provide uh, multimedia, so with the focus on audio, video, and real-time text. And uh, another important uh, aspect, and this was mentioned by Michael as well, was the integration uh, with, with BSAPS itself. Uh, so uh, we also focused on how they can receive calls or chats uh, case of a person in need is using a specific application. And in order to do so, we also utilized uh, the, the policy routing functions and uh, the capabilities of a policy routing function uh, that was mentioned by Luca. So if you look into the picture on, on the picture on the screen, uh, it, it looks like a burger and uh, I think it fits well to Michael's onion shown in the previous slides. And the most important thing here, uh, well, let's say that the burger topping uh, is the peering between the regional ESI nets, uh, which requires trusted relation and technical and organizational matters. So that was actually introduced by Michael by in, in the previous slides. Uh, just uh, one more remark, since there is an Austrian flag on the top of the burger. Uh, Tech 112 uh, is an NG112 standards-based uh, service to access emergency services via text chat. Uh, was one of the applications used in the Celeste project. And uh, actually that, that Tech 112 project in Austria contains all the NG core services for the mapping and, and routing of emergency chats to the PSAP of Austrian federal states. And actually that's in operation in Austria since February, 2019. And uh, I would say a good example to start small and get to know all the aspects around the NG112 in a manageable environment. In the next slides, uh, you will see some screenshots and some examples of uh, what we did in the Celeste project. Um, so first slide is, is showing uh, the, the Tech 112 client. So that's, as I mentioned before, the, the chat-based application. And if you look at the screen from left to right, uh, we, we have uh, on to the left the, the onboarding. So this is done just once after downloading and installing the app. Uh, you provide some uh, personal information. Uh, this is uh, just optional. So it's the only thing that is mandatory is to provide the uh, mobile phone number uh, just to to make sure that, that the device is registered and uh, you're known to the system. Uh, the next uh, is kind of home screen. Uh, so here you, that the user selects the emergency services and we also have some, some button for, for testing purposes to see if, if you have connectivity and things like that. And then to the right, uh, we have an example that uh, of some, some testing during the Celeste project. Uh, next slide, please. So here you see the uh, the terminating end of this Tech 112 application. Uh, so that's an example of a piece of integration via a web interface. But actually, that's, that's one uh, option since uh, it's standard based. Um, other integration options are, are possible. And uh, what you can see here is, is the map. Uh, 
with the actual location. So that's a, a border to Italy. It's, it's a Brenner border between Austria and Italy where we did some tests. Uh, you also see below the map some, some user data that is also provided uh, with the call setup and uh, uh, most important here, the, the, the chat window. And uh, to the right, uh, we, we see the application screen. So that's not uh, part of the PISA, but it's just uh, yeah for completeness uh, that you can see, okay, uh, this, this was kind of the chat uh, that we did during the test. Next slide, please. In addition, and since multimedia was also uh, an important topic of that project, uh, we also showcased the use of multimedia sessions established uh, from regional ESI nets or via the regional ESI nets and also including some uh, roaming scenarios. So here you, you see again the screenshots taken from the application to the left uh, and uh, to the right you see some examples from the um, PSAP application. So that it's actually Luca testing uh, with the mobile application and uh, with, with the PISA. Most important here as well is uh, to, to get the call allocation uh, with the call set up. Uh, let's move on uh, to the next slide. So most important when implementing the NG102 standards is interoperability. So therefore, Etsy organizes regular plug test events, uh, which I'm talking about next. So this slide uh, introduces um, something new uh, because in the past we, we did a lot of plug tests just in Europe and in the US, uh, they did a lot of industry collaboration events. So Nina calls these ICE events. And this year, Ina and Nina decided to organize um, a common interoperability test event and in, in this event, we will not only show that the NG112911 standardization is a global initiative, and we also show that we have quite a lot of, yeah, or we plan to have quite a lot of interesting transatlantic scenarios yeah, with, with, with that setup. Just note that the registration for this event is uh, still open, and uh, feel free to contact if you would like to participate. So basically, uh, the, the event uh, is testing interoperability of, of the standards that were already mentioned by Michael and Luca. So it's uh, from the European side, it's the ETSI DS103479 and DS103480. Uh, and from the NINA side, it's uh, the NINA IS3. And uh, I think if I'm right, it's, it's called the STA which I think stands for standard 010.3. And uh, the, the, the last part, uh, I think that's the origin of the I3 acronym. So what would be going to test in such a scenario, uh, for sure, is this peering of transatlantic ESI net uh, deployments. So we will have deployments in the US hosted by the Illinois Institute of Technology. And we also have a deployment in Europe uh, where we have um, the capabilities or the, the facilities from, from Etsy. So that's uh, used to people that participates in such plug test events. And uh, this will be uh, due to the current situation, a totally remote uh, event. So quite, uh, let's say, tricky for setting up the right in infrastructure. And um, in addition, what's also new is that we will also integrate with mobile network operators and web service providers. So this was mentioned by Michael before. So what we want to see here in, in, in scenarios is how to integrate with a mobile network operator and to see, okay, what do we receive uh, at the connection point or the point of interconnect of an ESI net uh, if uh, calls originate from a mobile network operator or if calls originate from a web service provider. In addition to that, uh, we also uh, look at uh, the, the well-known things in Europe like advanced mobile location and uh, also the NG Eco. From the scenarios, uh, it's not that different to previous events. Uh, uh, we will still look at the location-based routing. We do integrate with elements for routing and mapping emergency calls. 
and uh, this time we'll also focus on uh, the multimedia calls audio video and for sure uh, most important for accessibility the real-time text what's new uh, compared to the previous events is also the security part uh, since we are interconnecting different ESI nets we need to make sure that the peering is well secured that's it uh, from uh, my side and uh, thanks a lot and I think now it's time for Q&A. Thank you Wolfgang and uh, thank you uh, Michael and uh, Luca and uh, yes you're right now it's uh, time for questions and answers. I have already some of them uh, that uh, have been uh, posted uh, on the chat uh, during your presentations. So I will read them and uh, please uh, just feel free, uh, each of you, uh, to, uh, to answer. The first one would be on uh, geolocation. So um, uh, NG112 provides uh, geolocation. Could you explain what is the difference with handset der uh, derived location provided with AML? Can I answer that? Yes, sure. so Luca, please go ahead. <clears throat> Um, so the idea is that mm, this was this was tested during the plug test, all three situations. The idea is that a new version of the SID protocol embeds uh, uh, the location taken from from the phone, from from the device. Let's say it could be also a PC, not necessarily a phone. Uh, the location is taken as best effort. So the the best uh, way to provide the location in that very moment when you initialize a call is used. The main difference between this and AML is basically in the time to deliver. So when you initiate a call, you put inside the SIP inviter, which is the first message for call initiation, the location you found in that moment on your device, GPS, Wi-Fi, whatever it's uh, uh, the device capable of, and you use it to route the call. AML, which is most of the time transported by an SMS, is not used to route the call. It's used afterwards, when the call has been already routed and it's already landed on a PSAP to determine the location of the caller, precise location of the caller. Because today, let's let's put ourselves in the in the worst situation <clears throat> today to determine the route of the call between i don't know uh just to make an example of two spanish towns instead of making also always italian town madrid and barcelona you just need to know that you are in the surrounding area of barcelona or in the surrounding area of madrid that's pretty much enough to say call goes to madrid call goes to barcelona and then there is a question, where exactly are you in Madrid or Barcelona? Uh, so that's what AML is made for. We are talking about call routing. So some information that comes before the call lands in the PISA. If you remember the example of the square around the terrorist attack, you may have uh, geolocation precise enough to tell you if you are inside that box or outside. And based on that location, uh, route the call. AML cannot give you this capability because it would arrive only after the call has landed on the PISA. If Wolfgang or Michael want to add some more. Yeah, I would like to elaborate a little bit on, on your good answer regarding the mobiles, but one important aspect is also as we've seen that we enable um, or we have the assign it including NG112 as a service enabler when you're thinking of stuff like IoT, um, you don't have SMS capabilities, for example. And the point is to have one standardized way of providing a location, and it does not matter from which device, which um, sensor, um, which car it comes. So just elaborating on, the, on that. Uh, this is Wolfgang. Yeah. Um... I think everything had been said, but uh, there's just one aspect I, I would like to highlight is that in in the standards document we have, um, there is a specific element, it's called location information service. And uh, this one can act as, uh, let's say, location endpoint for AML. 
which would allow to seamlessly integrate uh, the, the IML uh, with the NG112 architecture and to utilize uh, locations provided by email uh, after a certain period of time, like Luca mentioned. So basically, uh, you would get, let's say, a first rough location uh, from a mobile network operator, for instance, uh, for the routing purposes, so to get to the right piece of. And if uh, AML has provided a more accurate location, you can just uh, dereference uh, the more accurate location uh, from the service endpoint. So it really fits in into that uh, infrastructure. Thank you, thank you so much, the three of you. And uh, well, still uh, on uh, location, we uh, I think it was Luca who mentioned the uh, indoor location. And uh, one uh, question is about uh, how indoor location is computed. Again, here I'm, I can say something about that. So, in principle, the idea is that the location used by uh, next generation we want to course or the new version of SIP course is a protocol or a format called the PD flow. This format is documented, let's say, so if you it's written P D I F law, L O. You you can take a look at the um, at the format to understand what's inside and all the ways to uh, perform such kind of, of location. I would say the possibilities are many. It's not restrictive. It's not uh, very, <clears throat> it's a, let's say, close-minded <laughs> as a format. So it allows a lot of different ways to perform uh, such geolocation. If I'm not mistaken, but for sure, Michael and Wolfgang can confirm or, or correct me. Uh, you may perform location based on GPS coordinates, uh, shapes, uh, like a circle or box or whatever. You can look for a location by even reverse geocoding by giving automatically a, an address location and so on. As for indoor location, I think uh, that PD flow is also used. So the same type of format can also include uh, specific details on um, indoor location, but they would be in fact uh, details of a more generic uh, geolocation format. Um, it is true, however, that there is a possibility if uh, data extensions are allowed in the C payload to add even more data, not necessarily referring to that geolocation to be added inside the same SIP call. But in principle, there is a format, right, for, for geolocation that is defined in the SIP protocol to be used for geolocation. Uh, this Thank is what's been, yeah. Yeah, basically, uh, if if it comes to indoor location, you may use uh, technologies like uh, Wi-Fi um, hotspots and also Bluetooth speakers. And uh, if the the mobile device has, let's say, capability to uh, utilize those uh, sources uh, for a sense of fusion, which means, uh, like in AML, uh, it, it's it typically combines different sources uh, of of uh, yeah getting location, uh, you could also add those things indoors. Uh, and if that's available, um, I know that, for instance, at airports, uh, you, you have the Bluetooth beacons uh, around. And if, if that information is available to the, the mobile phone and the mobile phone's application or um, operating system has the capability to utilize this, um, then it would be a source uh, for a quite accurate location indoors. And as Luca mentioned, uh, the format uh, is defined, and so if, if you put that information into the format, uh, you just provide it to the PSAP, and the PSAP actually doesn't know uh, what was the real source of, of, of the location. How was it measured? Uh, it would get uh, some kind of indication about the accuracy uh, and perhaps also telling about the technology that's being used, because this is also part of the bit of flow. Uh, but um, for the interface towards the PSAP, it's, it's quite independent uh, what kind of source had been used to uh, re to get the real location, if it's GPS or Wi-Fi or cell-based or whatever. Thank you. Let's go to another topic uh, that is more generic. Uh, we, I see here a, a question. What role, role do you expect telco network operators to play in the deployment or operation of the SINet? 
Again, I can give you my, this is my personal opinion. It's not based on technical facts or whatever. So please take it for what it is. My opinion is that uh, a telecommunication operator is the most appropriate candidate to think about the deployment of such uh, infrastructure, because at least uh, in terms of um, technology provisioning, not necessarily as the owner of the service. Now, let's make a distinction this time. Yesterday or, or today, even network operators, telecommunicator operators have the in in many in, in all in all countries, I think, in all countries they have they have the uh, let's say the rights and the duties to perform such services. So geolocated call and route emergency calls according to certain technological and legal standards uh, defined country country by country. So operators must be able to comply. And some operators will also provide the infrastructure for doing so. But in some extent, uh, ESAPs or the emergency services are, you know, giving them at a certain point a, a, a picture of what they want. Telecommunication operators cooperate and release the final plan for routing. This may slightly change in the future, uh, but again, it's my opinion. So my opinion is that a telecommunication operator still is the best candidate to deploy such technologies because of um, protocol knowledge, because of capacity in implementing, et cetera, et cetera. There are several reasons, no? Um, but on the other hand, th this is the chance for emergency services and for PSAPs, if you want, or ministries, to take back a little bit of uh, control over the global situation, which is more related to their job. So an emergency manager probably uh, has more need to evolve the way emergency are, emergencies are managed in his infrastructure, whether it's uh, nationwide, uh, region-wide, or so on. So the possibility here is that telecommunicator operators remain the main focus for delivering the technology and the infrastructure, while PSAPs, or more in general, um, emergency service providers, may get back a little bit more of power, such as I decide, uh, I would stress the situation, even I would decide day by day how to handle my calls, where to, sh to, to, to deliver them and so on, based upon the current situation that I see on my territory. I, I know it's, it's a stressed situation. I'm not expecting that an emergency service changes his mind every day, no? But potentially they would be much more fast to react to certain specific conditions should they be uh, should they appear on the territory now thanks to the technology provided by eventually uh, network technology operators uh, this may open the way also to other big system integrators or even if you want uh, i don't know cloud space owners would we see potentially an, an easy net uh, deployed on a Amazon web service uh, server. I don't know, technically everything is feasible. So this is not a principle where you can say, no, it's not. I don't know, maybe it will open potential new businesses for, for companies in the future to perform such, uh, to deliver, sorry, such uh, technologies. But again, it's my opinion. I mean, um, I see it a little bit more relaxed since, for example, there are a lot of voice over IP providers out there which already have a lot of experience with voice over IP since that's basically their core business. So they could also, I mean, as Lucas said or, um, already, at the end, it's not really um, depending on who's providing an ESI net. It's more about the shift of change or the, the, the change of the, the configuration ownership. So currently, it's really on the configuration side of the mobile operators when you want to have a change in the routing. But in the future, that kind of responsibility has to change because, as I said before, you have a lot of other sources where you will have emergency calls or emergency communication in the future and not necessarily every every um, communication type is performed via a mobile operator. 
Hey, we are running a little bit out of time, so let's uh, jump uh, to another question specifically on real-time text. Uh, do we need MG112 architecture to ensure real-time text routing? Real-time text will have to be provided by carriers by 2025 under the European Accessibility Act. In other words, NG112 is a sine qua non requirement for real-time text deployment. Uh, this is Wolfgang. I think the short answer is yes. Uh, as uh, Luca mentioned, that uh, the, the NG112 infrastructure is the enabler. And if you would like to, to see uh, new types of media like real-time text, it's just another type of media, uh, you would have to have this, this kind of infrastructure. Okay, so uh, I think we have uh, well one more comment. Uh, for your information, we finished the Etsy test fest for NG eCall, also testing the interoperability with NG112 PSAP. Uh, within the SAFE project, we specified the architecture for equal over IMS, taking into account also assignment. This is more a, a comment uh, than, a, than a question. And I think uh, we don't have uh, more time for questions. You have uh, the contact details uh, of all presenters. And also, of course, uh, you can contact me in case uh, you, you want uh, to ask uh, further questions. And uh, I think uh, we can uh, close now the, the webinar. I don't know, uh, Tavi, if you, uh, you want to add some words. Uh, yes, just uh, a little reminder uh, to tell you that uh, the recording of this webinar and the presentations will be available from tomorrow afternoon uh, on the INA website and also on the INA YouTube channel. Uh, you will be notified uh, with an email uh, when uh, it will be uh, online. And also, um, uh, I would like just to remind you that INA is uh, uh, scheduling a series of webinars until uh, the end of this year. Uh, the next one is next Tuesday, as you can see on the slide, about ensuring continuity of service of emergency call handling. Uh, so uh, if you want to attend uh, other webinars uh, and uh, know more about uh, the next topics that uh, will be addressed, uh, just uh, visit our website. Uh, so that's it. I, I would just uh, thank uh, everyone for the participations, uh, the, the speakers uh, for their really informative presentations and uh, uh, the fact that uh, they shared their time with us. Uh, we really hope that you enjoyed this webinar, that you have learned a lot. Uh, you can contact uh, uh, the INA staff and the speakers uh, uh, through the, the contact details shared uh, today. Um, and uh, that's it from, from our part. Uh, we wish uh, you a nice rest of the day. Mm -hmm.